So visible were the tensions of the 1950s on women that by 1955, the White House held a conference which it titled The Effective Use of Woman Power. Some 600 policy-oriented men and women met to discuss whether and how women power could be marshaled without violating the domestic code. That conference concluded just a few weeks later that a report that declared that the structure and the substance of the lives of most women would be determined for the indefinite future by their functions as wives, mothers, and homemakers. Recognizing the need for women's labor, the report nevertheless urged the government to support training programs compatible with women's roles as wives, mothers, and homemakers. You can imagine that not much in the way of policy change came out of this conference. Occupational segregation remained firmly fixed, but the proportion of women who chose to earn incomes continued to rise. I'll give you just a couple of examples. In 1950, 29% of all women over the age of 16 were in the labor force. Only half of them were employed full time. It was okay, after all, for a housewife and a mother to take a part-time job, but not a full-time one. By 1965, 35% or more than a third of all adult women held income-producing jobs. Two-thirds of those women worked full-time. So we see a rise not only in the numbers of women entering the labor force, but in the numbers moving from part-time jobs to full-time jobs. That suggests that slowly women were voting with their feet, loosening their attachment to the home and increasing their attachment to the labor force. Today, close to 60% of women are in the wage labor force. That figure compares to about 70% of men. But notice that close to three quarters of women hold full-time jobs. About 27%, a little more than a quarter, work part-time. We can't assume that all these women work part-time because that's what they want. But I think we can safely argue that a small residue of women still choose to identify with home and family as wives, mothers, and homemakers.